I am just looking for my introduction, folks. Sorry, I thought I had it here. There it is. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to our fourth and right now final virtual artist talk in our new series presented as part of our Epic Women's Directing Project. I'm Kim Blackwell. I'm the Managing Artistic Director at Fourth Line Theatre, and I want to welcome you all this afternoon. Our Epic Women's Directing Project uh, project focus on the lives and careers of Canadian women working in theater. And I'm so excited to spend some time today with the amazing Fiona Reed. But before I do, I just have a few things to note. First off, I want to acknowledge our season sponsors, Nexicom, for their continued support of Fourth Line Theater, Exit Realty Liftlock as our major sponsor, and Supporting Roles Interactive Training for being the sponsor of our Epic Women's Directing Project. Thank you all so much. Now some housekeeping notes. I just want to let you all know that your audio is muted. If you'd like to submit a question to Fiona or I, we would be happy to answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A button on the menu at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and you can type your question in there, and then Lindy, our host, will collect them and give them to us during the Q&A. Also be aware that if you mistakenly exit the webinar or have any technical difficulties, you can simply re-enter the webinar by clicking on the Zoom link that we sent you earlier, and you'll get right back the same way you arrived. Make sure that you follow our social media e-blasts and visit our website to register for our upcoming virtual events. On June 4th, we're excited to present Maya Ardell's live reading of her one woman show, The Cure for Everything, which is a follow-up to You Fancy Yourself, which she read in early May. And you can view it on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, but please note that the live reading can be enjoyed as a standalone performance. You can register to attend Maya's reading of The Cure for Everything on our Eventbrite page, and the event begins at 2.30 p.m on Thursday, July, June, sorry, did I say July? Thursday, June 4th. You can also visit Fourth Line Theatre's YouTube channel to view all of our virtual events after the live presentations. And now, would you please join me in welcoming the incomparable, amazing Fiona Reed. Hello, Fiona. Hello. How are you? Fine. Um, oh, start my video. Yes, start my video. I did. I can see you. Yes. Um, so where are you? I guess is my first question. Where do we find you today? In Toronto. Um, at, at our loft yeah on um yeah. you were mentioning when we were talking last week or early, earlier this week that you um had been you've been quarantining or you've been uh, living at your place up in buckhorn is that right yes um in the Kawarthas, and um i left new york fairly quickly uh, when we were shut down and um uh, I quarantined for 14 days and uh from from my husband as well which was odd and um and then we've just been very isolated and 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 we're very lucky that we can isolate somewhere like that yeah. um we count our blessings every day so. is that this place that you had you had a terrible accident there a few years ago did you not and you spent time in the peterborough hospital am i am i imagining that no you're not i was trying to get flies off the ceiling and i stood on this wicker sofa and the sofa wasn't quite secure and we hadn't put the banister in yet and i i fell a couple of flights and i um and i'm and i'm very lucky i there must have been a guardian angel because um yeah yeah i i was in the peterborough hospital and i it was good i mean i just i i i, <laughs> I just had a head laceration and a collapsed lung but uh oh and i busted a tendon in my wrist but but you know i Okay, three major things. Do you, now, I'm sure, and you were alone, right? And I learned that you don't climb on anything unless you check you have really firm footing. You know, I've done some really dumb things. And um, uh, so, yeah, that was a lesson. Lesson right. learned. Sure. I'm sure. Well, thank you for joining me today. I have so much I want to ask you and get through with you. So I'm so thrilled that you're here with me. Uh, in the busy times, this wouldn't have been possible. Everybody was so busy before. And so yes. it's so incredible to get this opportunity to sort of dive into you and your career and your life and your work. <laughs> I am curious, you were born in England, right? Yes. Yes. And so both your mom and dad British? Uh, my father was Scots and my mother English. Yes. But okay. military, my dad was a doctor in the military, so we moved every three to four years uh, to a different country. So um, born in England and, and then um, uh, Africa, um, England again, United States, and then we emigrated to Canada because my dad felt that our education system, our education had been so interfered with that there was, it wouldn't be a good idea to go back to Britain. So. 
um, he got a job as a, a doctor with the Ministry of Health and we emigrated to Canada. And so I, we did all that by the time I was 12. So I'm Canadian. I mean, I wouldn't fit in in, in the UK. This is, this is who I am. Do you have a memory of the f first country you lived in as a child? Like you Africa is my first memory, Nigeria, um, for sure. Um, just because, I mean, I remember things that weren't in photos and stuff. So I know that those are my very first memories. But I, I think it was not a healthy way to grow up. I think that as much as it might have led to my being an actor, uh, it led to my being, um, it took me a long time, <laughs> true confessions, to grow up emotionally because uh, I just always knew how to get by. And in terms of, of making friends, it was, you know, make friends. And as soon as I might have become a little bit irritating to people, oh, we're leaving town now. You know, I don't, I, it took me a long time to learn about how to be a good person and the golden rule, you know, means you treat people as you want to be treated. And it took me a while to learn the things that I should have learned on day one. And um, uh, maybe it really helped in terms of me having a good ear for, for, for accents and things. But I, I think emotionally it's, take, it's taken me all of my 68, almost 69 years to to grow up in ways that I've noticed other people did a long time ago. Right, that's so interesting. I mean, it's an incredible observation, but you're incredibly self-aware for someone who talks that way. And you're also very, the, the bit I know about you, incredibly generous and thoughtful. And you have deep, long friendships. Always. Wasn't always, wasn't always. I had wonderful friends in high school who uh, tried to teach me to be more thoughtful I think they could see that I wasn't intentionally cruel. I was just thoughtless sometimes. Um, I remember on a lunch hour, all of my friends um, just cornering me on the sidewalk and saying, you have a crispy crunch and you have to share that. And I remember thinking, I don't wanna share my candy bar. And they'd say, no, you've gotta share, you've gotta share. So I had to learn some stuff the hard way because I was the youngest in the family. So well, I, I got away, away with far too much. Yeah, I wondered if it was something to do with being the baby because I you have an older brother and an older sister, right? Correct. 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 And can I ask why your parents chose Canada? Like, was it like putting a, their finger on the, the Commonwealth map or was yes. there some connection? Um, I, well, dad served in World War II well, we were, had been in Washington, right? So it was, well, it's not like it was far away. We had visited friends in Canada a lot on summer holidays. Um, Dad um, served alongside Canadians and they were the best um, best soldiers, best actors, I always say. <laughs> and um, uh, he had a real affection for Canada. I don't think he was necessarily the kind of Canadian that uh, we honor now because I think he thought being British and Canadian made him kind of special and that my generation didn't grow up that way. I grew up with, you know, that this is a much more inclusive country. So in my teenage years, I saw all of that explode wide open and it became a much more exciting country for becoming more inclusive. Um, but yes, he, he knew that we wouldn't do well with the education system if we went back to Britain. And so we moved to Canada. Um, so. You were in Toronto in the mid sixties. I'm just curious. I, did you were you affected at all by the hippie movement or the Yorkdaleness or was any of that part of your reality? Uh, the hippie thing was just coming in, I think, when I was finishing high school. Because if I if I graduated from high school in sixty eight, sixty nine, so yeah, so um, I remember my best friend was a minister's daughter, and uh, I borrowed my dad's car and went and picked her up and said, "Let's go to Yorkville." And um, we went down to Yorkville and, and closed the windows. We were terrified. And she'd go, look, there's Bob Dylan. Look, there's Jimi Hendrix. Of course, it was just people who looked like them. <laughs> and I remember some, some guy was stoned and he actually walked on my dad's car. Like he actually walked on the front of it, up on the, over the top and off the back. And so I got home and the next day my dad said, Fiona, the, the sort of indentations in the car, did, did you, and I just, Lied. See what I mean? I lied. And um, I, he never found out that somebody walked on the car. But you were, you were a good little, generally good little suburban girl. Like, you, did you go to Lawrence Park? Lawrence Park, yeah. yeah. I don't know how good I was. I don't think, it, 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 I goofed off uh, 
too much. And, um, and then had a teacher, a wonderful teacher uh, who, and, who just told me that I was goofing off and it was stupid and that I should use my brains. And so she helped me in terms of chemistry and math because I was hopeless in those. And um, so ended up doing fairly well, luckily, when I graduated. Um, uh, I was an Ontario scholar, I think. And anyway, I, so it got me into McGill. But I was a bit of a faker, you know? I, I, I didn't, um, I only knew how to get by. I, I think it's why I have this sort of intense desperation <laughs> all the time because, because I knew I didn't have the proper manual that everybody else had. I hadn't been prepped. So it always, you know, it's why on the first day of rehearsal, I think I, I somehow I've missed something. <laughs> You, know? but you always act a bit like that, and yet you are probably one of uh, five to ten of the most prominent actors in this country. Like, do you think it's you? You have a, a, a sense that you're going to be discovered as a fraud, and yet I would say it's a perfectionism. Do, do you think of yourself as a perfectionist? Well, I like to work hard, but when I started, I was an actor. I think I did the wrong kind of work. I think I worked so hard that I didn't allow whatever my knowledge was doing to play with my instincts. Um, and I just didn't know how to relax to begin with. Um, that's taken a lifetime. Um, but yes, definitely that feeling of being exposed as a fraud. I think a lot of actors have that. <laughs> and, um, and, and perfection, yes, yes. Well, just you always want to be learning. I mean, you know, I mean, just before I did this interview, I did a, a webinar on, you know, how to do a self tape. I mean, I, I can never learn enough about that stuff. You know, it's just always trying to, there's more that you need to know, you know. Um, but not everybody approaches life like that. Like you have an innate curiosity, I think. Well, I remember as a young actor looking at some older actors and thinking, I never want to be that because you kind of think you've got it all together. So you, I feel it in your voice. I feel it in what you do that you're achieving your performance as opposed to becoming and being the character. So I didn't want to ever rest on any laurels in terms of technique and stuff. So I think that's a bit of a credo with me to not let that happen. And I, I you know, it could be happening in spite of one, uh, but oneself, but I hope not. Right. And so Lawrence Park Collegiate, I read somewhere that you did not act there at all. Is that possible? You have to talk to Bill Needles about that. Um, Bill Needles ran the, ben ran the drama club. I brought this up before and I've joked with him about it. Um, uh, you know, one of the conceivers of Winfield Farm. Uh, no, I auditioned for the drama club and I didn't get in. I was no doubt dreadful. Um, and I'm sure he just thought, oh, who needs that energy? Uh, so teachers would let me do things orally in front of the class. So they encouraged that aspect of my personality being a show off. Um, but uh, no, never got into the drama club. But that's why I always tell students, I say, whatever you don't get is such a great motivator for what you become as an adult, you know, because I couldn't get arrested. And right, but you were, and this is what's interesting to me. When I saw you and was working at Canadian Stage and you did Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney, I didn't know all this, that you actually trained as a, a, a musician and as a singer. That's what you were doing, right? Instead. Well, in school, it was all music. And it was a great music school, Lawrence Park Collegiate. A really good music school. And I was in the orchestra and uh, music was my passion, but I wasn't, um, you know, talented enough, certainly at the viola to do anything with it. Um, and uh, so went off to McGill and, and, and um, took theater there. But uh, I think music, a love of music has informed the way I approach language. I can always feel the music in language. And if it's a translation that has not caught the music of the original language, I, I can I can suss that and 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 need to find whatever the music is, you know. Um, I just find that really, really helpful. I think it's informed me more than anything because I, I didn't really have a proper training. Um, didn't get into the National Theatre School, auditioned for the National Theatre School after a year at McGill. And again, I'm sure what they saw was truly dreadful and I don't have any bitterness about that. Um, and uh, so I, 
I picked up dribs and drabs doing theater at McGill and then, um, and then really the first 10 years of my being an actor, it was the classes I did as a professional that taught me more than anything. I'm wondering about something like when you did God of Carnage, I mean, uh, Yasmina Reza's play. So you would have done that in the English translation. Would you have looked at the original French? Cause you're, you're talking about the musicality of translation. And yeah. Would you have looked yeah. at the original that, uh, French speaker? That's, um, that's such a good translation that I, 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 I did not. Um, and and uh, as I remember, there was no, issue of, of, of timing or music. It's a very, that's a very cleanly written play. Um, so yeah, so not there. I mean, in Chekhov, it can often become a thing, but I don't read Russian. But um, I mean, the interesting thing about Chekhov is that so many of the old, old British translations sort of made it into a, an English, tea, made things into English tea parties. You know, they made it they put it through a filter that, you know, when you think of Canadians and Russians, there's probably more in common because of our landscape and our geography than, than so it doesn't require the British filter. So, um, so doing, I think I did the first David French translation of um, The Seagull many years ago, and it was really good, really excellent. Wow. So was there a moment that I'm curious, it and what was the moment when you had this desire to be an actor as a young person? Oh, I wanted to in school, but it was probably for all the wrong reasons, to be noticed or something silly. Was, was, was um, like, were your parents theater goers uh, when you no. were? No, no, not really. We did go, we, when I became intensely interested, I forced my parents to go to Stratford with me um, and they indulged that. Um, but my dad was not a healthy person to have in the background uh, for um, for, for me starting out. You know, I um, I did McGill during the year, and then I went. But the Banff School of Fine Arts had a training program in the summers at that time, and I would go to Banff in the summers. And um, and my dad, uh, I always had a part time job but it wasn't enough to pay for being at Banff and he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't help me. And I just, I, 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 you know, I cried so hard that he, he ultimately did. I think it cost a couple of, you know, a few hundred dollars. But, um, and, uh, but I do remember once saying, will you come and see me act dad? And he said, well, why should I see you? I've seen Beatrice Lilly, you know? So it was always, you know, and ultimately I remember once when I, I, I did a commercial and he would watch and, and I, I said, you know, dad, I, I'm not gonna make a mistake on the commercial because they do it 200 times. So stop looking at it as if I'm gonna mess up because I don't mess up, it's a commercial. But, but I've always had this inner thing that, you know, he's watching and I'll mess up. And it's, so he wasn't healthy that way. The one time I looked down, I think it was in waiting for the parade at the Tarragon and I saw his face and he was beaming from ear to ear. And I, and I remember thinking, you know, I've, I've created this whole ghoul in my head of this disapproving, because he was pretty critical, but uh, yeah. But, but ultimately terribly proud of you in that moment. Does, yeah. does seeing him in that moment and waiting, the, like looking down and seeing him at the tarragon, beaming and then knowing that he was proud of you, did you have to shift your thinking about him or? Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. I started saying, because all my life I had, was always confronting him. And so, yeah, yeah. So I had to um, deal with that. And and that took a long time. <laughs> so you you, you got your degree at McGill and you went to the center. Yeah. And so what, what was your first acting job out of school? Uh, well, my very first acting job was at the Banff School of Fine Arts. Because I remember that theory because I, I missed my sister's wedding, which is what tells me how ambitious I was. Yeah, yeah. She never did forgive me. So, yeah, ever, 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 ever. <laughs> and I think I, oh, it was so tasteless what I did. I think I wrote, I said, sorry to miss your wedding. I'll be sure to make the next one. It, I, I thought it was funny. Fiona. I did not think it was funny. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, and there was never a next one. Um, 
but I, I just, to me, there was no choice. This is a play. I, I get to be in a play. So I've always been quite single-minded that way. So um, acting at McGill, I, you know, I was in a very bizarre production of Ubu. Uh, and anyway, um, and then out of McGill, what was my first job? Was that the question? Yeah, well, your first, I guess, professional job. Well, I think it was um, Land of the Young, a school touring company in Ottawa. And um, yeah, we school bus touring to schools. And um, Paul, uh, Peter Boretsky, uh, Jenny Phipps's husband, was directing us in these sketches. And um, and that's, yeah, anyway, so that's, that was my first job. And then my second one was, well, no, it's just, I, that's where I met my very best friend, um, Veronique Leflaguet, uh, uh, a Quebec actress who, who, who never understood. She said, why we don't have to, uh, they say to meet at the, uh, at this place where the bus will take us. But she said, we can go out tonight and we can just be there tomorrow at the school. We don't have to meet the bus. Why do you have to meet the bus? You English are so obedient. So, you know, we were nearly fired. Like it was really bad. And I, uh, the, the, uh, but my very, oh, so when was summer stock was one of my first jobs land of the young was probably my very first then i would say it was summer stock i was an apprentice at muskoka summer theater and that's where i met my husband who's still my husband um and uh was, I was, Matt the carp was he a carpenter yeah he was a carpenter at the, at the muskoka summer theater when there was port carling and gravenhurst and uh the lead actress broke her arm and so uh, I think I was a better actor than I was a props person. I, I wasn't a great props person. Oh, I, you got put on stage? They, they, I, 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 got, I went on, I can't remember what the play was, but I went on and then, so then they cast me after that. Uh, so yeah. Did you all, like, I'm just trying to understand the, the, the sort of the essence of this. Did you always know you were going to be a successful actor or an actor or, was there ever any doubt or thinking, oh, I better go and learn to be a school teacher or, or something else? My mother, my mother always said, you must have a degree. You must, you know, and I, so I went off to McGill thinking I might be a social worker, but right away I met this gal and we decided we were going to be actors. And, and anyone that knew me then um, said that I was so ambitious that there was no mistaking. I didn't see that about myself. I do remember my first acting class at Banff. We did some exercise whereby we were all in the dark crawling around. I can't remember something to do with that. And he commented on all these other people in the class, all my fellow students, and he didn't comment on me. And so I chased him to the admin office. And I said, uh, uh, Mr. I can't remember his name now. Robert Graham? Was it Robert yes, Graham? Yes, it was Robert Graham. I knew that. And I said, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, you, you didn't comment on, on what I did in the exercise. And he said, oh, you're just way too intense. <laughs> now, I suspect that's not the first time you've heard that in your career. Oh, but since then, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, now, so what, brought, what brings you, how do you get to Toronto from the school bus tour in Ottawa? And I lived in Toronto. I worked at a Max Milk as a cashier. Um, I, uh, oh, and then, so somehow that led to, gosh, I'm probably getting all this wrong. I, somehow it led to, uh, I, I somehow I got a TV series uh, uh, for children. Uh, or maybe I got to Second City, because some, I don't know how, uh, was my first gig at Tarragon with Brenda, um, the amazing Brenda, Brenda, oh, she died at the age of 26. Oh Everybody's gosh. gonna know this. Married to Gary Reinecke. Okay, um, someone will tell us, maybe Lynn Slotkin or somebody. Oh, yes, else. yes, yes. Um, brilliant actress. And we did, that was my first gig and I was rooming with Jane Eastwood and she said, look, I've had enough of Second City and um, oh, she's gonna, no, not Brenda. No, it wasn't Brenda no. Bassett. Brenda Donahue. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> so, so that will not be the first time this happens. Well, in many and, minutes. and Jimmy Rowe. Jimmy Rowe also said Brenda. Oh, God bless Jimmy. Um, so um, anyway. Um, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so I was doing um, um, uh, a play at Tarragon and uh, with Brenda Donahue. And I did the Second City audition. And because I was living with with Jane, and I so I got the Second City audition, and that 
And so then I'd gotten this series for children um, called Dr. Zonk and the Zunkins with Dan Aykroyd and Gilda. And anyway, so I was doing the series by day and Second City at night. And I remember uh, being suicidal. I was, as my mother would have said, oh, darling, you're just overtired. But um, I remember actually, oh, this is, I'm really putting my idiocy on display here. Like, it doesn't matter if, if, if I get a cheap laugh. Nobody's watching, nobody's worth it. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I phoned the, the Suicide Bureau at one point and I said, um, you know, I really, I just can't take this anymore. I just, I have to, and she said, well, what's going on in your life? And I said, well, I've got these two, da -da -da. and she said, well, you need to give up one of those jobs. <laughs> and I said, well, I can't do that. And she really kind of lost interest. <laughs> So is it, I mean, by 1974, I'm just curious, how do you get that series that defines your early part of your career, King of Kensington? How did you get that job? Oh, well, I was doing, Dr. Zonk and the Zonkins became Coming Up Rosie. And, um, uh, and I, and, oh, and I guess I was doing another show at night with Jane Eastwood. Um, you know, at that time there was this dinner theater thing where you would do a sort of a variety type show. We did something at Theater in the Dell, uh, Jane and me, and it might have been Victor Young. May he rest. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, Jane had done the pilot of King of Kensington and they asked me to come in and read. And I was 24 and I remember thinking, how am I gonna, looked like I can be, it was gonna be Al Waxman at this point. Uh, Jane had done the pilot with Paul Hecht and, um, and Jane was absolutely amazing about it. I mean, we became best friends and, and I will always, I mean, she just said, they'll go for whoever they want. And um, I remember I went home and I borrowed my mother's kilt and her pearls to try and look older and, and did this read with Al. And, um, and then I got the part. I never really appreciated it. I didn't really, I thought I was going to, I wanted to be a serious actor. So I think one of the sad things is that I probably didn't enjoy the success of that to the degree that I could have. I just have a quote, can I read you the quote? Sure. I have a couple of quotes about King. One, you said, if I hadn't been so young, I would have appreciated it more for what it was. Mm -hmm. But even more interesting, I thought you, you said, I've never quite got over the depth of that bonding with an audience that the King of Kensington created. And for me, that was the litmus test that said, yes, Canadians want to see their own on screens. Oh, well, that's just because people have been so incredible to me. Uh, I just, you realize how excited people are to see a Canadian that they recognize from television. I think it, I, I've always said Canadians really want Canadian programming and what are the things that get in the way? They're economic factors because I think Canadians do want to see their own culture reflected and their own artists reflected. And, uh, and that was, yeah. And I remember after that thinking, I will never be believed as anything but Kathy King and um, Dougie Chamberlain with whom I worked um, shortly after I left King, he, he, he would joke and say, you know, if I was doing Chekhov, he'd say, Kathy King goes to Moscow, or, you know, Kathy King goes to London, if it was restoration. Oh, no. And he would always send me postcards wherever I was, because I remember my, one of my first plays after I'd done the King of Kensington, or maybe it was during the off time of King of Kensington, was um, uh, She Stoops to Conquer. And, and I do remember walking down a staircase on stage, it was my entrance and thinking, it'll be Kathy King in a wig and a, and a period dress, you know, because the likability factor uh, mm -hmm. is such that it's not got a lot to do with acting, that, that TV likability thing. And I needed to get rid of that. Um, the very first play I did after I quit the King of Kensington, because I quit after three years, it went on for two years after that. Um, and that was a really, felt like a really big deal at the time, but I just wanted to be done with it. And I've often wondered if that was a stupid decision, but um, I did Ashes right after that with R.H. Thompson. And, and that was a play that was, you know, really stark. Uh, it's about a woman who loses a baby. Well, that's, I always, it's always, it's about my character story. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> it might've been about more than that. But. <laughs> 
I did lose the baby, okay? Um, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and with my idol. Um, and uh, yeah, I had to really go, this is not Kathy King, stop it. You yeah. know? So, okay, so a couple things. So you became so beloved as Kathy King and that, that relationship between you and Al was, I mean, you guys became huge stars and it could have gone on for who knows how long. What was it in the middle of it at year two and a half where you were like, I got to get out of this? Well, that's the part where I probably needed therapy is that um, <laughs> because I think it was my saying, I think my dad was pretty critical um, of the program and, and uh and I always wanted to, st I was still trying to please him on some stupid psychic love. love so that it wasn't love. deep enough somehow? Huh? It wasn't deep enough? Yeah, yeah. So, and I thought, oh, well, I'll never be taken seriously as a serious actor and I'll, I'll never get to Stratford and it, all that silliness, silliness. I mean, at the time I left, the CBC was really willing to meet me halfway and to, to really, they were saying, well, whatever you'd like to do, or, you know, and I remember just saying, no, I, I just really want to leave. So, wow. you know, I, I have to say that what I did after that, I have to believe that it helped me become a better actor because I did sort of feel a bit like I had to start all over again um, as, as an actor. And then there was a show that they were gonna write called Fiona and I said, no, I'm done with sitcom, I'm done with sitcom. Now, I'm a sitcom, baby. Just bring it my way, fine. <laughs> Does it seem a little bit crazy when you think back to, to walk away from those things? Yes. Or are you like, it was, it all makes sense? It's insane what I did. Okay. And, <laughs> and to say that, um, I mean, except the thing that I've always wanted to learn from people. And there were so many people I wanted to work with in the theater and so many artists I want to work with. And, and it was when Robin was at Stratford and having the, the heyday of Stratford when Maggie was there and, and, and so many fine people. Um, what, what was the question? Was it crazy to leave? Yeah, I guess it was. And, but do you think ultimately it was the right decision? No, if I had to do over again, I wouldn't have. Um, but then maybe I could not have become, you know, I could not have shed it that easily if I hadn't gone when I, when I left, you know, this is the thing about not knowing yourself well enough, not having enough self-knowledge to say, well, how can I incorporate that and use it a certain way? But I also have to say, it may sound impossibly spoiled. I have to address the fact that our generation had lip grants. We had um, so much, there was so much TV going on. It was a, a plethora of, of, of job opportunity. And so if it seems, uh, um, you know, there were many other people, many other people having success as well. You know, there was a lot of work to go around. And, and I will state unequivocally in today's climate, I don't think I could have become an actor. I don't think I could have done it. I so admire the younger generation for the number of skills they have to have in their back pocket and their ability to self-produce and to write and to, there's no way I could have done that. And, and so I just applaud the younger generation for their ability to self-create and self-generate. Um, it's really laudable. And to even try to think about trying to have a career when there are so many of them and the opportunities are less and yeah. they're so tenacious. I mean, you are, you're really, uh, you're an example of, of tenacity and ambition in the best possible way for anyone. I wanted to ask you, because you wanted to be taken seriously as an actress, like as a serious dramatic actress, I think, yes, at this point. But you are, you, you are that for sure, but you are a hilarious comedian. Was there, did you have to struggle with an acceptance of how bloody funny you are on stage? Accepting myself, I think. Oh, oh you accepting myself. Uh, um, I've never understood the funny thing, which is probably a good thing, except I do remember Christian Linkletter saying to me at one point, you really should study clown uh, because you need to, you don't understand why people laugh and you need to understand that. And I thought, oh, it's better I don't know. It's just better I don't know. And then when I worked with Rick Roberts in Rue Knowledge and he's done a lot of clown and I, I watched his ability to go to that Zen zone and then come right back and his ability to really take a dangerous, occupy dangerous place as an actor on stage at times. And I thought, that would have been a good thing. So that's one of those things I maybe should have done. But uh, 
um, yeah, never quite understood it, but I, but I've always had the credo that I understand the comedian who does serious work more than I emulate the serious person who tries to be funny. Interesting. I saw you do a thing at the Shaw, I think in 2002, you're playing, is it, Ju wait, Judith in Hay Fever? Did you fall down a staircase? Mm -hmm. It was hilarious. Well, I, I do, um, uh, I think, did Marty Meriden direct, or did, no, Christopher directed that production. Um, uh, Marty directed another uh, coward that I did. Um, but Robin Phillips uh, directed me originally in Hay Fever. Um, I owe a lot to Christopher and a lot to Robin in that, but I have to say the falling down the stairs thing, um, Robin said, he said, now Maggie did this in 1970, or something and he said I, I want you to do what she did and I said oh okay and I think it was before we started rehearsing we were in um, Winnipeg and Edmonton we were going to do a co-production and I remember it was a I phoned the archives at Stratford and said can I see the video of the production because I wanted to see how she did it I remember driving in this incredible snowstorm with 18 wheelers on either side of me thinking I am insane doing this and going there to see this grainy black and white video of how she did it. And she did go from, I don't know, the 12th stair to the third, I don't know how. Anyway, so Robin helped me with it. And then when I, uh, yeah, he helped me with it the first time. I don't think I had a fight person to do that. And then when I did it again at Shaw, Chris very kindly got in um, uh, John Stead and, and, and we did it. And I still to this day, I don't think I could explain it especially with a gown and heels on but uh no it was that it was wonderful that oh was a wonderful moment because it was like the idea of a double take but it was a whole body take of you know because i'm seeing my husband david sherman may he rest um uh kiss myra arundel and instead of just doing a double take it she falls down the stairs yeah so now I just want to read out this list of names here, and this is by no means complete, but Marty Meriden, Christopher Newton, Neil Monroe, Diana LeBlanc, Robin Phillips, Richard Rose, Michael Shimada, Morris Panage, Glennis Lation, Susan Shulman, and the, like the list goes on, Ted Dykstra. You have worked with the top directors in this country, Albert, and, and, and so many. I'm curious about what you look for in a, in a, in a good director or the kind of director you like to work with. Well, nowadays, I sometimes say if somebody is younger than I am, you better direct me or you'll be sorry. <laughs> you don't want them to be afraid of you, afraid of your reputation. I, yeah. The danger is that they'll go, well, you know what you're doing. So I, and I go, no, I don't. And it goes back to what I said earlier. You'll bring out the bag of tricks and you don't want to do that. And I remember I always used to think, you know, I want to be a blank canvas on day one and that I choose my idiosyncrasies and that I don't do my own uh, and I don't just bring them up. I think I've got a little less scrupulous on that count. Maybe need to work on that. But um, so um, I, I hope that a director knows the play really well and I hope that they challenge me. Um, I thought about this before I did this interview because um, I think that I've probably disappointed a few directors uh, in that um, I, I think it's really difficult because you're coming together and you want to have the same vision of the play. And the fact is, it's the one thing we don't, we negotiate our salaries, we negotiate the circumstances we're gonna work in. We don't negotiate, do you see this play the same way I do? Are we going to in, be inhabiting the same world? And, um, and if we are, it's delightful. And you, you, what I'm asking a director to do and, and what a good director does is they establish a world of the play so that you are unselfconsciously in the world of the play and are able to risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're not risking, if there's ever self-consciousness on your part, you're not risking and you're not building a character. I'm not. So, um, like if you're outside of it, right? You can never be outside of it worried that you're not being, that you're being made to look foolish or you're not being supported, that the director has to be outside of it so you can be completely inside of it. Yeah, I mean, I think I should look foolish. It's just, 
I need to trust you that you're going to work with me when I do look foolish. You know, I mean, I remember one of my favorite notes from Neil Monroe when I played Arcadna in The Seagull. Um, he said, uh, he said, you're an actress, yes? Oh, because, oh, because there's a, at one point she's talking to uh, Nina and she does a, talks about being an actress and she does a little dance. And Neil said, um, well now you're an actor, yes? And I said, yes. And he said, so what are you doing in this moment? And I said, well, I'm showing what it's like to be an actor. And he said, oh, we know that you're an actor. You don't need to show us. So, um, you know, he was sort of cutting away a layer of artifice and asking me to communicate that in a different way. I mean, notes like that just are very helpful. And then um, if, if some directors over the years, I would say, um, over the arc of my too long career, um, I would say that uh, some directors work text more than others. And, and if I have a great long two page speech and they're not gonna work a speech, I can go home and have a heart attack. You know, um, my, my, one of the things I loved about working with Robin and, and, and Neil has so much mapped out and Robin has worked so hard before you work with them. Um, and, and, and Joe Ziegler, same thing. I mean, so many directors, uh, Marty, um, um, that, they can tell you what you're communicating because um, I need someone there to, sh to tell me what they're reading of what I'm doing out front. And um, I remember Robin explaining on the first day, he said, I will maybe come and move your shoulder or move your, you know, because he, he he's choreographing and in, in a way that, you know, is this communicating? Um, some actors just hate being, blocked in the first two weeks and I say no whatever if it's if it's helpful for the director to have a framework of blocking initially um then block me um some just like to do a rough blocking and we go on and that that's fine um because if it gives me something but some actors it makes them self-conscious it doesn't me but um I love being directed which my husband always laughs at because I hate reading directions of anything on a box or anything. So, uh, but, but, but uh, I, I enjoy being directed. I just know that this intensity thing that I've probably been headstrong sometimes and, and, and I'm, I issue a blanket apology for the directors to whom I've maybe been that way. And um, if I cramp their style in any way ever, I, 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 I think I probably have, I mean, trust is a big thing. So, so uh, the best thing is when you have that trust. Um, well, another one of my favorite directors, Richard Cottrell, he directed me in Indian Inc. And on about day four of rehearsal, the stoppard, uh, he said, Fiona, he said, I don't know what you've been doing up until now, whether you just played Lady Bracknell or something, but he said, this is a 34 year old British sensuous woman in India and you're doing some kind of Lady Bracknell, I don't know what you're doing. And I just remember being in shock and I always think I'm gonna be fired. So um, I go home, I sleep with the play, I just, and I realize, oh, I've got to go way deeper. And, um, and, and it's one of those notes that I just hang on to because he just basically said, whatever you have come into the room with, that's not it. And, and it was really challenging. And when I wasn't fired a week later and he didn't mention it again, I thought, well, he's either given up on me or it's okay. <laughs> but did you find something else? Like, are you aware in that process that yeah. when you went away and slept with prey, you came back with something yeah. deeper, richer, more authentic? Yeah, I came, I, I, I went away to start thinking more sexy, wanton, mid 30s, mid 30 year old thoughts, I think. So that was the first show I worked with you on a Canadian stage. Oh, really? And is it okay to say that you were nude in that play completely yes. naked? I, I, I behind have. Some, behind some voile, like scrim. behind some sheer fat. Don't ever be nude unless you're behind a scrim, please. Had you been scrim nude on <laughs> Honey, we could still see so much. It was beautiful with the water jug. And, um, <laughs> and so many wonderful actors in that play with you too. But, oh, um, and beautifully designed by Susan Benson, right? Oh. Oh gosh, boy. But um, had you done 
that level of nudity in your career up to that point? I don't think that level of nudity, I can't remember now. It felt like the first time I'd been totally nude. And I really did. I think I was 51 and I think I thought, oh, if not now, never. So um, yeah, and I do remember the first day when Richard said, you know, we'll call it when you're ready in rehearsal to do it full on, just let me know. Um, and then you just hope for amazing lighting and um, yeah, and you know, it's all- You were going to the gym all the time. I remember yeah. you telling me that, swimming. not that you yeah. needed to, yeah. or swimming, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, but, but so yeah. Um, and it's all very instantaneous and very tastefully done. Um, and it's more about, you know, a white woman being uh, in an enclosed space with, uh, with a, a native Indian for whom that is just never to happen. And it's more about his reaction, I think, than, than mine. How do you approach film and television differently than theater? I, I don't know if that's a fair question to ask. Well, um, it, it, it isn't, diff I think to think of it differently is 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 maybe not helpful i think there is a myth that i mean a good actor is a good actor and a good director will i think the thing is the tendency if you're doing series stuff is that you will get less direction and you've definitely had less rehearsal you show up and you're working with strangers a lot of the time um i try i think casting directors sometimes have it in their head that actors um you know, make more facial reactions and that's not good for film. Well, if you're making more facial reactions, you're not a great actor on stage anyway. So I don't see that distinction so much. I mean, what I try to do is think that the camera can see inside my head and can read my thought, which I know is true. So, uh, so once I know what the shot is, I, 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 um, I might internalize a little more, but uh, it shouldn't be. Because, because I mean, look at you know, look at what Scarlett Johansson does in that scene in Amer is it a marriage story? The, uh, and and she's and and beautifully the way he choreographs it. You know, directors now are being so much more playful in terms of telling a story and being more circular. Actually, directors directing the way the way Robin would direct on stage, very often in circles rather than up down. And and um, uh, so if you're telling the story that way. It's not about, it's only if you are on a close up that you would maybe, you know, pull it in a little more. But I don't think, I think John Houseman said, you know, you shouldn't think that it's different. Um, okay. It's, it's now, not helpful. Mm. You, left, you left King of Kensington and made your way. How quickly are you, is it Stratford first time then or Shaw first that you go to? Well, I went to Stratford first. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah, I remember his trap of thinking, ooh, I don't think I'll come back unless I do the performance 11 times somewhere else and then come to Stratford because um, it, 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 I never felt, I think I put such pressure on myself at Stratford that I probably didn't do my best work there. Um, the freedom to risk and to fall flat on my face, I don't think I gave myself that freedom. I also don't think at that time it was necessarily in the air. Um, I did feel as if, I mean, the joy of Stratford was working with amazing people like Susan Wright and, and I had a lot of joy off stage, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's code. That's code. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and she was such an irreverent actor. I mean, I think she hung beads from her dressing room door and and you know and they would always say you mustn't wear pearlized makeup and and she would say oh please you know give me the polyfilla and I'm wearing I'm wearing the pearlized and you know I mean we just had such fun um but yeah uh uh Stratford came first and then I was working um in Montreal uh doing a show I think duet for one and I got this postcard from Christopher Newton would you like to do private lives with me and I remember thinking okay this is a joke and I remember looking at the way you do um, um, prints, you know, that this will be one out of 36 and whoever answers first will get the part. And um, I didn't know him. Um, and um, I had met him once because he came to the show that I did with Brenda Donahue. And um, he, we sat in the bar with a bunch of us and I remember thinking, well, that's Christopher Newton. And he had these 
curls and he just looked like um, a Greek god. He was so gorgeous. Anyway, so um, then got this postcard and wrote back and said, would love to. So then I showed up and, um, and that's when I met Nikki Cavendish and Jim Mison. And um, anyway, so yeah. So I remember feeling it shot. Oh, I can fall flat on my face here. Uh, but, you know, there was a spirit of playfulness and risk. And I don't blame Stratford for that. I blame myself. It's the pressure I put on myself at Stratford. Um, so potentially different cultures, not bad or good, just different cultures. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, I really had a good time at Shaw. And Christopher, you know, I kind of owe him uh, a lot of my career. Yeah, you know, he really took a chance on me. Was it 10 years straight? At Shaw? It was never straight. Um, Mison used to tease me that, well, you, don't, you only come for two years and then you take a year off. And then, you, you know, um, I always wanted to keep my hand in a bit of TV and film. And so I took the odd year off. So I can't remember. At a time, it felt, I remember the first year of my, of my firstborn's life, I, I, I didn't do the Shaw that I was offered. Um, and, uh, and then went as, as, uh, in, the, in subsequent years, I went when the kids were small. But childcare at that time at Shaw was really an uphill thing. Now it's all organized, like people like Jenny Wright and you know, they, they've, um, uh, people have really, young women there have really gotten together and made childcare a, a thing. <laughs> so I'm curious, how do, do, uh, how do you, how did you balance being an actor who would go anywhere basically for the job the good mm. job with raising the kids and making it really work. The idea of balancing it and the idea that you ever get over it, I don't think you ever do. Um, you know, I had a, a wonderful husband who was there for them when I had to go out of town. I tried to only go out of town to a regional once a year if possible. Um, and Shaw, they would just come down and, and live with me and I would have babysitters there. Um, but uh, it was never easy. And, um, and they would always come and visit me once wherever I was. And um, so they grew up with it. And do you, do they talk about what it was like to be raised by, like, can they articulate it? Is it part of what you all talk about? Like being raised by a mother who was so busy all the time or is it is that an unfair question to ask? We don't No, No, I think, um, well, they don't know what it was like to not be, poor thing. So, um, uh, but, I, but I think elements of it weren't easy. And then I think um, I am perceived in spite of my, uh, my self-doubt um, and, and, and very often not very confident, uh, I am perceived as being sometimes headstrong or, and I think that um, wasn't always easy maybe for, um, my daughter, she's very sweet and generous about it, but uh, um, I do remember them being very small and coming to the theater. Um, and Alec at a very young age, he must have been three or four, uh, I guess it was, it was present laughter at, at Shaw. And he, he, he said, mommy, you do good acting. Um, they always enjoyed going to theater. Um, Julia experimented uh, and, and was an actor uh, and is an actor, but she's now going to law school. But um, she has wanted to explore that part of herself. I, there's nothing, I, I can't, um, I'm still coming to grips with that really. I don't think it was easy for them, but you manage. I, I, I don't think it was easy as, I, as easy as I thought. And children, I mean, what I think is good is they know that I, I love to work and that they know that I work hard. And I think that ethic is probably not a bad thing. And, and from their dad too, Mac has had a scenic um, woodworking business and um, we both work stupid hours and we work really hard. So I think if there's any positive legacy, it would be that. But they've also seen me, you know, crying into my, into my uh, coffee, you know, because mommy doesn't have a job. And well, I want to ask you about that. It's a great segue. Were, are there, have there been dry periods? Uh -huh. Have there been dry periods? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
for sure. And the older you get, the drier they get. Yeah, and longer. Oh yeah, no, really, really. And, I'm, and I've never really learned that very well. Um, I've never learned, I think resilience has been one of those qualities that it's taken me a long time to, to learn. And I wish I had to my children shown more resilience that mommy may be out of work, but she's still cheerful. I, I, I wasn't so cheerful some of the time. But you adore working. I mean, would mm. that be, is that yeah. a fair thing to say? Like, I love to work. It, it gives definition to my life. I don't know quite what to do with life without the work thing. So I'm sure we'll get to this in the 90 minutes. But so the thing of going from a New York schedule to not to having no, you know, because once I have constraints, I know how to behave. It tells me everything I need to know. <laughs> so in the dry period, uh, periods or period, um, how do you navigate it? What do you do? Well, you work out, you, you have to keep a schedule you have to keep swimming. And, and, and you know, any actor will tell you auditioning is draining and, um, and difficult. I mean, I think, I think the difficulty, if I were to bequeath anything, it would be to say, because any actor will tell you, if you have a job coming up, there's a way to enjoy your free time. Um, but if you don't have a job coming up, it's hard to know what to do with that free time. And um, so one tends to spend a lot of energy on how do I get work? Um, and um, these days it's all about how to, you know, how to self tape, how to, um, how to market your whatever. <laughs> well, because now it's, a, it's kind of the weirdest dry period, right? That was unexpected and we don't know when it will end. Mm -hmm. but no, but I, so I never, I just was never that good at it. And, and as I say, if you had something four months, six months hence, then that would make life livable. And not to mention the financial difficulty of, of, of getting by. Um, but I think you just look for friends in the business and you support each other. And um, you try to be generous when your friends are getting work and you're not. And um, yeah, I, I, there's just no easy way around that. And, and I think to have gone through my career with the lack of resilience and the lack of ability to, to rebound, um, I think uh, has, has not, has, I've wasted a lot of time, I think, on, on um, going fear? to like, stupid places. Like you know? living yeah. in fear or having some fear guide you or? Oh no, just saying I am not worthy. What is the matter? I can't get work and feeling sorry for myself. Just waste of time, waste of time. Okay, so I want to just say, um, I have so many things to ask you about, but um, just, just, a, just a titch of, of what you, who you have played in the canon, the English language canon. So B and Three Tall Women, and you talked about playing Ar Arcadina, is that how you say it? Arcadna. Mm -hmm. Arcadna. And the Seagull, Lady Bracknell, Blanche in uh, Streetcar, Maureen and Beauty Queen, Judith and Hayfeeder, Fever, Mrs. Lovett, Gertrude and Hamlet, Martha and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Ruth and Blythe Spirit, Violet and August of Sage County, Julie and London Road. Oh my God, I loved you so much in that. Uh, the Queen in the audience, uh, you did the Canadian premiere of The Children, you've done so much Noel Coward uh, with Robin Phillips and others. Is there, so that, like, that's the canon for women, right? In so many ways, and I haven't even touched on it all. I mean, we talked about Death and the Maiden before we started going live, but um, is there one that stands out for you that you just <sighs> adored? Um, Virginia Woolf, for sure. Violet and August Osage. I, I, I could do that role for a year, I think, and still love it. How do you find the reserves to, to go where you need to for both uh, Martha and Violet? Because those are... Yeah, they're hard. Dark, messy characters. Yeah, and 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 Martha two times a day. You know, I I remember at the Neptune, I think we only had the way they scheduled the two shows on a Saturday. We had I had like forty five minutes before I had to start the prep for the second, and I, yeah, that was that was hard. I, and and um, uh, Streetcar felt like. Uh, um, it felt like a, I mean, I think it is called the female Hamlet. I, I, you know, I, I um, that's a real, cause you have to, you have to be pretty wrung out by the end. Um, how do you, uh, it's, it's not hard. It's not hard. It's, 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 you go to the place, you just go to the place. And I'm just, I'm blessed. I think a lot of people could go to that 
you know, yes. <laughs> that, is one uh, from, from your resume, your large resume, is there anybody you haven't played yet that you want to play? Oh, well, I, I never, um, in terms of Shakespeare that I never, you know, I, I really would have loved to have done um, Beatrice in, in, in Much Ado, but, um, but I played older Beatrice uh, for Robin with the opera company. So that was as close as I ever got to that. Um, but uh, um, I don't waste a lot of time. Uh, I just feel, I feel very lucky and very blessed. And I try not to, I mean, if I was to speak to a young actor, I would say, if you, if you can, um, if you can make a trajectory of your career, there are certain roles that would be good to do by a certain age and good to do by a certain age. And, and if you have a certain cachet and you can approach artistic directors, but, but we're dealing with the changing face of theater, right? We're dealing with, you know, the regionals aren't, um, you know, large cast plays and, the, and doing those kinds of plays. And, and um, it's, it's, all, it's all changing um, yeah. and in some ways necessarily so. Yeah, you know, it's interesting when I was working at Canadian Stage, I, and I, I would go back to fourth line in the summers and I would direct and, um, but I always said to people, I would give all of my work up at fourth line to be the personal assistant to Fiona Reed, R.H. Thompson and Eric Peterson. And it's because when you would come to Canadian Stage, you would remember who I was. I mean, I worked in PR and 90% of the people who worked there as performers would never remember me, even if they had been there several times. And you would ask about me and I always say to people, I think it's because you have seen the highs and the lows of career. You've had the great high successes, but you've also had the low lows where you couldn't get arrested. Do you see your career that way? Can you think of your career and the generosity? Because I know you've, even the way you talk about the crew on Harry Potter, which I want to talk to you about in a second, is the, you were the most generous talking about the crew when we met well, in New York. Part of it is, I know when someone, you know, when you work with Kim Blackwell, you can smell right away, you know what you're doing. And um, I have a lot of respect for people who know their craft and know how to do it well. I can also smell when people don't like actors. So when people do like actors, I really, you know, I revere stage managers. I think it's the most important job in the theater. And the odd time you get a stage manager who doesn't really like actors and you think, and you went into this profession, why? Um, so I really appreciate stage managers who, who, who like actors and, 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 and do their job well. I appreciate great cutters and, 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 you know, I just, it's such a collaborative craft. And so when people know what they're doing, I revere them because, um, because I can't, I mean, you know, someone could mess me up in a twinkling if they wanted to. I mean, it, it's, I just ask that we're all giving our, our, our hundred percent at any one time. And, um, and when I, and when people know what they're doing, I just, I just go, I worship you. I worship you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, because we can't do it without each other. And I, I think one of the reasons why I loved Harry Potter was because, um, was because like London road, we were all out there knowing that if any one of us messed up, everyone else was gonna pick up the ball and instant forgiveness. You messed up, move on, move on. And Harry Potter's like that. And we can't do what we do. You know, the crew should take a curtain call with us. Uh, you know, in so many shows I've done, you think the crew should be out here because um, you, you make it or break it uh, literally based on their coming and showing up and, and, and doing their job to the, to the hilt, you know? Well, it's it as crew people and administrators, it's it's unusual your behavior and your the way you've always been around people who are not necessarily the actors or the directors is is commendable and unusual. I want to ask you about uh, how does Harry Potter start? I mean, you're sitting in Toronto or you're sitting in Buckhorn, and is it just that you decide does someone reach out to you to audition for New York or how I, does I, I wanted to very much. Uh, I think my agent had seen it in London and said, you know, there are a couple of parts in there for you. So when the, the casting, uh, Jim Carnahan came from New York, um, because Canadian actors, because we are versatile, are very well thought of. And um, uh, John Tiffany, the director will say, you know, you need the classical skill set. And um, what we underestimate as actors is how much Stratford and Shaw affect our profession. Uh, whether you've been taught by someone who works at those places or whether you've worked at those places briefly or the influence of a place, those places that have so much money invested 
um, by government and by endowment is astonishing and it, it yields a level of craft that is enviable. And so they like coming up here to cast for a show like that. And um, so they went through a lot of people and um, uh, I, I went for uh, the first audition and then I got called back and then I was doing the children at the time. And um, then they wanted me to come to New York for a call back and um, gosh bless Ida Holmes because she gave me, um, she gave me a, a, day, a day off or two days off. I can't remember, we were in tech at that point. And so I went for the call back in New York and um, we had to do a big 45 minute movement thing too that was pretty nerve wracking. Um, and uh, yeah, and the audition. And then I didn't hear for ages and then I, I heard that it was maybe going to be San Francisco, and then uh, in October I heard of uh, eighteen, and um, so that was a whole adventure. And you know, going to a place where nobody knows you, and um, you're writing your own playbook in terms of what people think of you and whether you know what you're doing, and um, and it was just such an adventure. Um, it was so great. And so the level of trust, again, between us and each other, because again, it was like London Road. Um, I think I enjoy things where really, you know, where one person can suck the energy out of the room, where it's all about company, it's all about ensemble. And they want people who play well with others. And so, um, you know, I said to someone, how do they know we play well with others? And somebody said, they ask around. So anyway, <laughs> but, uh, um, so it was just such an exciting, you know, I never for a moment forgot that I was on Broadway and I never for a moment thought that this was a hugely expensive show for people to attend and that what it meant for people, it was a big event in their lives. And, um, and I kind of, I, I just, it was a, a great, great adventure. And it, you know, it was cut short, um, but, uh, and Toronto will happen. So we pray and, uh, and that cast assembled for Toronto is just a dream cast. So, so you were playing Trolley Witch and a whole bunch of things, or had you started to play McGonagall? No, no, I, play, I was playing Trolley Witch, Umbridge, and um, Aunt Petunia. And in Toronto, I will play McGonagall. So, um, so we change it up and Trolley Witch. So, so I they, guess because your contract was going to end in June, you won't ever go like you won't go back to New no, York. No, no, it ended June twenty eighth, and so. Um, so yeah, the, I don't know when Broadway goes back. And what uh, what was going on? Like, did you know it was getting bad in New York? Mm -hmm. You were there? Yeah, yeah we did, we or? did. Um, um, it's just that there was, nobody knows anything. There was no information, you know, there was no testing. So we knew that it was something to be a feared, but with no testing. So it was just hard to know what the protocol was if somebody felt sick or, um, and you know, there's that whole thing of actors don't get sick and well, is the right thing to stay away if you're sick or, you know, and um, because of the right to work, you know, the management can't, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but they, uh, they the first thing they say is, well, we can't tell you not to come to work. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It turned out there were only two in our company that had, um, that, that had it at the end, uh, that oh. announced that they had it uh, after we'd stopped work. But we, there was another actor, it was as if people didn't really want to talk about it because nobody wanted to be negative. And this one other actor and I thought, we would keep saying that, say, this is crazy. This is crazy, why are we doing this? And you wanted it to stop, you wanted the show to we, stop. We did not feel, yeah, we didn't feel safe doing it. We, I mean, tell actors to be socially distanced, I mean, you know, you're waiting in the wings to go on stage to a crowd scene. You hug people, you, you know. Um, so, uh, so we did on May the 11th, we did a two shows and- um, On March, March the 11th, March? Sorry, March 11th, okay. and, then, and then May 12th, the Broadway League met and we were told don't, you know, this is it and, and come back on April 12th. So yeah, it was all pretty sudden, but, but no, it did feel weird, but because of the no testing thing, um, and, uh, and you know, Broadway has never shut. It shut for two nights after 9-11. It didn't even shut during the Spanish flu. So 
Um, I don't, I think it was the unthinkable, you know? Um, there was one actor, uh, Steven Spinella, who, who really felt, he said, you know, there aren't enough ventilators in New York and this, you know, save your paychecks. You could be out of work for a long time. And everyone kind of thought, oh, that's kind of alarmist. And, but he was right on every score, right about everything. So, yeah. Did you come back right away or how long did you stay in New York? I, I waited three or four days in which I should have taken time to pack a little more, but I, I thought I was going to be back. Um, so uh, I sort of isolated because I didn't want to, you know, by that time, I think for a month I had been keeping my distance. I think I thought, well, if there's anything I can do, I don't have to go into the green room. I don't have to, you know, be near people too much. I think I was being a bit careful that way, but um, no. So I, I, I came back on the Monday because by that time the Canadian foreign minister or somebody was saying, you better get back if you're Canadian. And I thought, oh, they're going to close the borders. And I remember when I was traveling, people were nervous that they were going to close the borders. People on the flight were quite nervous. But you got back okay and then you mm -hmm. immediately went. And then self-isolated, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you one more question uh, because you've, been, you've had these moments, these huge moments, Harry Potter, and I was so cool to see the big banner on Broadway. <laughs> Uh, in in September when when we were there, it was just so amazing. And King of Kensington, and then you're kind of your next iconic thing. And I know it's a small part, but is my big fat Greek wedding. Oh right. And right. did you know while filming it, you're like, oh yeah, this is going to be huge. Oh no 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 no. I mean, it, at that time when it came out and had its success, it was the highest grossing independent film, and uh, produced by Tom Hanks Company, Playtone, and um, Oh no, no idea at all. And that was when I worked with the incomparable Bruce Gray. And um, not a clue, not a clue. I mean, it was just such a, it seemed like a fluke. And, um, uh, but Nia Verdalos is a, is a uh, she's a wonder woman, you know, she's astonishing. And she, she knew what that film should be. And um, so, yeah, so um, my only regret is when it came time for, Greek wedding two, I was pretty tied up at Shaw. We were doing the Divine, the Sarah Bernhardt play, and um, I just um, Jackie bent over backwards uh, to release me as much as she could, and um, but I they had to cut a couple of scenes, and and that's okay. But Br Br Bruce Gray said, "Darling," he said, "You can do all those plays. You will be known as the Bunt Lady in my big fat Greek wedding." So he said, "You know, you better show up." <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, and I just wanted to also mention, I, and I'm just curious about your thoughts about it. So you have received the Order of Canada. I did. The Actor Award mm -hmm. of Excellence, mm -hmm. uh, two doors, a Sterling, a, the Barbara Hamilton, the Jesse, an honorary degree at Bishop's University. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what those kinds of awards and recognitions mean. Well, when they called for the Order of Canada, I, I said, no, no. I said, I... And she finally said, Fiona, you know, <laughs> we thought you were worth it. Enough people thought you were worth it that maybe you, you know. Um, but, uh, well, it, it's huge. I mean, it's, it, it means that your peers and, and certain communities think you are, it's, I guess it's huge. It's a kind of validation of, I guess I must have done something okay, you know. Uh, um, Yes, I mean, I, it, it is, I can only feel inordinate gratitude um, because, yeah, it's people saying that you, maybe you did something worthwhile, maybe, but uh, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing you can do in life, in anything, is show up and work really hard. I. I don't know about talent. Uh, I just know that if you don't work hard, it doesn't matter if you have talent. And so whatever it is, just give it everything. Um, and, and, and so I couldn't have done it without people like my husband, who's always supported my career to a degree that probably wasn't healthy. Um, but uh, it's just really important to, 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 to work hard. And I think because I had such scant education, always moving to a different country, I always felt I was catching up. So I always made myself 
be prepared, you know? Well, you also do this interesting thing where you kind of yourself effacing before anyone else could possibly say anything bad about you. Not that anyone would. Sometimes to my own detriment. Uh, I, um, I've, I remember doing an interview where I, uh, I self-effaced to the degree that I thought, oh, well, that, that just looks silly now. It just looks silly because you've taught yourself down so much that you know it's gonna care. So, and, and I've also learned, for instance, in New York, you know, when I was working there, if you don't feel confident, you just have to pretend confidence sometimes, you know, and that, that there are things that only work from a confident place because you're being asked to just show up and deliver the goods sometimes. So um, I think because what was so hard about Harry Potter was I was not sustaining any narrative. I was two minutes as one character, two minutes as another character and, and doing quick changes and do, 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 and hitting the ground running. And so, and ego, forget about it because nobody knows that you're all those different people and you don't show up long enough to make any kind of impact, but you, you'd think the wrong thing for a second and you'll mess up. And so there were times when I just would have to go, you know what you're doing, show up and do it. Um, um, you know, Jim Mizon used to always come backstage when I just, just said, and just say, don't fuck up. And I can't tell you how often I just think about that. Like, you know, there's a time to maybe, my self-effacing thing is a bit of BS sometimes because it's, it's, it's don't pretend you know what you're doing because that thing of, I really know what I'm doing, I think can lead to arrogance, which is really unattractive and it doesn't make you a better artist. So I think to humble yourself before the text makes you a better actor and it makes you more versatile because you're not bringing yourself to the table. You're discovering raw materials in yourself to be that person on the page. So that's why I think self-effacing is sometimes a way to get myself out of the way. Makes sense, it makes sense. Do you think there'd ever be a moment in your life or your career where you'd, you would say in a room or you'd go into the, the beginning of somebody, like, you know, like I, I do my best, but I, am, I have a long career and I'm very good at this. Like it, it would never be you, is that, do you think? No, I don't think it would help me or anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> There's an incredible moment. I, I've got to turn it over to see if we've got questions. I'm sure we do. But um, in Beauty Queen of Linan, <clears throat> where you hold uh, Old Mag's hand to the stove. Can you just talk a bit about that? Well, I just have to. Uh, one time in the show I did with Brenda Donahue, Blitzkrieg, that was the play, I had to point a gun at the audience. And of course, if I'd realized what I was doing to the audience, I don't think I could have done it. Same with putting um, uh, Joan Ornstein's hand on the stove, burning her hand in fury at my mother because she won't let me go to America. And um, I had occasion the next year, oh, because I had another fall. <laughs> I fell um, off a ladder that didn't have rubber things on it. And I broke a fine bone in my wrist and, and you have to get that plastic surgery at Sunnybrook. So I went to, it was the Ross Tilly burn unit to see a plastic surgeon. And he said, oh, he said, I have to tell you, and that was a humbling experience. Um, he said, I saw you in Beauty Queen of Lanann a year ago. And he said, I have to tell you as a plastic surgeon and burn specialist to see, <laughs> <laughs> to see what you did was not how I wanted to spend my evening in the theater. He said, it was very painful, to which you can only say, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. That's the play you should not have seen. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But it, it was easy to work towards that, like all the difficult moments and all the, the characters. You I don't know what an audience is experiencing. I only know what I'm doing as the character, so I don't know how awful it is. And it's just as well I don't. Did, um, I know you lost, you lost your dad in 2002, right? Good, good on you, yeah, yeah. And did you get the Order of Canada in 2005? Is that when it is? What does it say? On I it? can't remember. Uh, something around there, seven, seven. Did he ever, he, he didn't ever get to see you get No, 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 no. And but was hopefully you... with enough therapy, I didn't need to please my father anymore. Yeah, right? yeah. Did your mom get to enjoy it with you or did she already start it? My mom had... Oh no, she didn't have her dementia. What did she? Yeah, my mom had dementia, so uh, she had Alzheimer's. So uh, I, it's not like I could have taken her with me or anything. So uh, she just was always incredibly proud of me. And 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 once she had dementia, she no longer criticized what I wore. So that was really a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I she, remember she you was, were such a good daughter to oh, her. Oh, she was so delightful. Whether she had dementia or not, she was an utter gift as a human being. And I've always said any character I've ever played is just a version of my mother. She should have been an actress. Wow. 
It's amazing. We still have the blanket she knit for Maud Rose when she was born. Oh, yes, yes. I remember delivering that to you. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah I, I um, like well, okay. I want to turn it over to Lindy to see about questions. I, I can go on and on, but I have to let you go in a few minutes. I know that you're going to head back. But Lindy, are you there? In theory, Lindy, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, we've had quite a few questions come in. Okay. Thank you both. This is lovely. Um, so first from Lynn Slotkin, she says uh, for Fiona regarding her accident, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the question. You have worked in Canada and on Broadway. Is the acting different in each place? And is there something that one country can teach the other country about doing theater? Um, no, I mean, I think what I'm so grateful for about Canada, a good actor is a good actor anywhere. Um, you can kind of smell when somebody has classical chops and that does happen quite a bit in Canada, thankfully. Um, I think that we underrate how versatile we are in terms of our skill set uh, as actors in Canada. And, and I think in the States, it, it, we, they don't have Stratford or Shaw. So I think it is a, a, a very special thing about us that we should never take for granted because that was government investment that took that. It wasn't, I mean, they have a lot of private endowment, but, but it was a lot of government investment too. So it's one of the things that I think, two of the things that make us great. And, and Canadian actors, I think we have a humility as a, as a, as a cultural ethos. And, and that humility, I think is, um, we just go about and do our job. And, uh, and I think that that's, it's a great, I think directors really enjoy that because there's just less of the, the BS in the way. So it made me really proud of my craft and my nationality. Sarah Farb was there with me and we would just sort of share quiet glances of, oh my God, you know, we were just so proud of each other and of, of, our, um, of our posse, you know. Great, thank you. Um, and from Bull and Cross, uh, we have a question for Fiona. What is your favorite thing about acting? That I get to be someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, yeah, that I just get to be someone else, that I get to, um, I remember playing that wonderful heroine in Day for Night. The, I think it might have been the first stop art I did. And that, that you get to sound articulate and you get to have these words that that these gorgeous words that can sound extraordinary I, I to get to be someone else and say and and and, and say the words of great playwrights like Edward Albee or Tennessee Williams Edward Albee Tennessee Williams Tom Stoppard um it's just the biggest biggest gift in the world I love that um, we have a comment and a question from Beth Mainprize um, for Kim about the series. So she says, Kim, this has been a wonderful series of conversations with fascinating women, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much for giving us this gift. I'm curious to know what were you hoping the series would accomplish? Do you feel that you got what you hoped for? And what have you learned through this month of conversation? Well, thank you very much for the nice comments. Uh, it was a bit self-indulgent, I've got to say. I've always wanted to sit with, uh, had a, a little um, group of, of women in my head that I wanted to do this with maybe as a podcast. And then we're all so bloody busy until March 13th, 2020. And so when we started thinking about what we could do because it became apparent that there, this might be for a while and I want, we, everybody was rushing to do digital things because we have to stay distanced. I thought, well, I could do that podcast series on Zoom. And so it, it partly it has, it has made me feel better mentally. And these are women I admire greatly who I think obviously have had great careers, but maybe haven't gotten the attention that they deserve. And they have so much to teach us, Fiona and Judith and Nancy and Jillian. And so I feel like I have, I have so much I've taken away from each conversation and I'm learning so much. Great, thank you. And one last question from Charles Rowe. He asks, what will it take to see you acting at Fourth Line Theater, Fiona? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Maybe not much. <laughs> <laughs> I love going to fourth line. Yeah. I love sitting outdoors and, um, and seeing how wide the canvas is, the field out there. And, um, and I've seen some really fine acting there and some wonderful plays. So um, I, I think about it. So um, yeah, nice to have, yeah, nice to have that as a thought, as a possible thing. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> Uh, once you finish all your Harry Potter in the next few months and we're going to think, you know, I think we're going to think such positive thoughts about all of that stuff coming back mm -hmm. soon, I hope, mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you would be welcome anytime. Well, hopefully when this is all done, people will need theater more than ever before. Um, we just have to all feel safe first and there are a few tunnels to go through first, but uh, theater is essential to our being and um, we must do it again. We must meet again. It's why I resist Zoom to some degree. I still do warm ups with my Broadway cast on Zoom, but I resist a lot of Zoom exploration of theater because there is an essential aspect of, uh, of the physical contact that is, um, I hope, irreplaceable. Yeah, I, I hope so too. That, that, that conversation between art <clears throat> and audience, right? It, 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 it feeds both you're feeding each other the spoken word in the air and the timing of how you take the bounce when someone else speaks and it sits in the air and then you respond that can only happen in real air <laughs> yeah yeah i think we're making do right now and lots of people are doing That's amazing right. things and and uh but yeah eventually we have to we have to get back together mm, we have to get back together lindy is there anything else no, oh, that was all for the Q&A. Oh my gosh, that's so great. I'm just looking if I have asked you all my questions since I've got here. I wanted to ask you just one more question that I will let you go about Death and the Maiden. And I mentioned it. You got very involved after doing Death and the Maiden with victims of torture. Mm -hmm. And I, I am curious about why you became so, uh, so involved after doing that play. I mean, I know that the play had- I suppose it started for research and, and then it just continued. And then I got involved with a family. And so once you're involved with the family, you know, you're in for the, for the, for the long haul. Um, and uh, it just, it was very interesting to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just something that, that you realized that in Canada, of all places, we have people walking in the street, you know, that are dealing with with that as a legacy in their past and trying to remake their lives. So um, it just became um, it became an irresistible thing to do for a while. Um, and um, I just want to make one more comment about you know, this is such a great country to come to in so many ways. And I, and I will say the safety net that we do have, we must embrace that because being in New York and, and realizing, you know, the healthcare being so different and this, the social safety net aspect of it is so different. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it's better, you know, for artists, thank goodness we have, at least we don't have to worry about that. But, um, and I suppose the, the, the aspect of art that can heal um, was one of the things that, that got me interested um, and to learn so much. And these people, you talk about heroism, you know, these people that have such darkness in their past that can come and remake their lives for their children and um, make sacrifices themselves. It's, it's, um, it's humbling. This is, this is a great country. Well, on that note, I want to say thank you so much, Fiona. It has been oh, just my you. absolute um, joy to sit with you for the last hour and a half. And um, and I can't wait to see you on stage in Harry Potter when it happens, hopefully sooner. Thank you so much. It was just been, it's been I was so nervous and you've made it <laughs> easy. You're, you're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're a wonderful subject. Be well. And we'll talk soon, okay? Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Wendy. Bye-bye.